Hello and welcome to a delayed Football Hipsters English Breakfast podcast. Uh, delayed because we're recording on a Monday. It happens every once in a while when there's a, a massive Monday and there's a theme developing with massive Monday games, hugely built up by Sky. Um, they're often not very good. So I'm glad we were worth waiting for or not, as the case may be. Uh, I am your host, Chris, and uh, unfortunately... I am not with my regular co-host this evening. Uh, Ross is poorly. We might get him to say a word, maybe two words, three at absolute maximum later in the podcast if he dips in. But he's not very well, so I've given him the night off, unpaid, of course. Um, yeah, I can't afford his wages, in the truth. It's too good for us. But luckily, we have a replacement, and we have some breaking news as well. Uh, his replacement, first of all, is Mr. Josh Dore. Good evening, Josh. Good evening. Hope I can be a decent super sub. Well, um, you say that, but you are actually, we're officially breaking news on this podcast. You are officially now our new signing. Um, free transfer. You know, we're not expecting much, but we're, we're very happy to have you. So uh, welcome aboard. There's been some brilliant free transfers and uh, I'm sure that might come up later. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> good, good segue, like that. Very well yeah. done. Um, but yes, for our listeners, uh, regular listeners, you'll know that myself and Ross do the English Breakfast podcast uh, with the occasional drop in from Danny. Uh, Danny is still with us. Don't worry. He's, uh, he's a busy man, but he'll be back in the winter months, I'm sure. But uh, as of today, Josh is joining us uh, for the English Breakfast on a regular basis. So most weeks you'll have a three man crew and occasionally it will uh, just be me and Josh or just be me and Ross. Or if I fancy a week off, I might just give the podcast to these guys and say, hey, hey. Anyway, enough of all that. So welcome, Josh. Let's get on and talk about some football, shall we? So uh, let's start in reverse order then. Now, I know you didn't actually get to see the Merseyside Derby, so it's not a huge loss. Trust me, it wasn't the greatest. But a uh, last minute goal from Sadio Mane, um, I'm sure upset Ronald Koeman greatly. Uh, as Ross was telling us pre-pod, he was the man who, of course, dropped him uh, when he was playing for Southampton and then tried to convince him to stay. Anyway, points go to Liverpool. How big a win do you think this is for Liverpool? It's a last-minute goal, albeit with nine minutes of stoppage time played. It's a good momentum swinger, isn't it, to get a last-minute w- winner um, in such a big derby, and it puts them back in touch with the title-chasing pack. Absolutely. Um, it certainly helps from a selfish point of view for someone to be putting pressure on Chelsea. Just every little helps at the moment that at least there's a chasing pack rather than just one team trying to get Chelsea who look completely you know, unbeatable at the moment. Um, but yeah, a last minute winner is always going to be uh, a great confidence boost for any side, uh, especially one that is built with the foundations of team spirit like uh, Jurgen Klopp has brought to Liverpool. Yeah, he seemed to enjoy the goal. You'll be surprised to know. Um, And uh, yeah, another good performance from Mane, set up by Daniel Sturridge of all people who came off the bench late. Hit shot coming back off the post and Mane was the first to react. As I say, it wasn't the best of games, so there isn't a huge amount to talk about. There was a a Ross Barkley naughty tackle. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, I've certainly seen a lot of stills about him halfway through a man without a ball in sight. That's a very nicely way of putting it. Yes, that is a very nice way of putting it. (laughs) It was um, a poor challenge, I think it's fair to say. He had a largely frustrating game once again. And um, I want to just ask you quickly on on Ross Barkley. Do do you you buy the hype? I mean, you know, he's he's very, very hyped in in the English media anyway. Obviously coveted by England. Do, do you buy into it? Or do, do you think he's at the wrong club? Is he being played in the wrong position? What do you make of it? I really like Ross Barkley. Um, I think he still has a future for England. Um, there's a lot of parallels you can pull with another player, Jack Wilshire, in terms of how their career's gone. Very promising in the beginning. Maybe a couple of injuries, maybe the wrong manager, especially with uh, Martinez, who helped him with his offensive play. But that's not how number 10s generally are expected to play in the Premier League now, which 
he's finding under Kuman, who wants a bit more from him in his game. So perhaps this is just a bit of tough love and we'll see him come out the back of it better. Yeah, he definitely came out the back of Jordan Henderson tonight, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, if you pardon the expression, um, if you haven't seen it, it, it's a horrible challenge. It's To be honest, it's an ankle slash leg breaker. And I think Jordan Henderson is a very lucky boy to uh, to be quite as flexible as he is because it's not good viewing, has to be said. But um, well done to Liverpool and Everton seemingly reverting to type after... Uh, predictably, of course, beating Arsenal last time out and uh, now seem to have gone back to losing at home again. So the natives will no doubt be restless, but nevertheless, um, don't want to pick on him again. But a certain striker went a little bit quiet once again tonight. Um, and Everton just, in his defence, couldn't feed him for the long periods of the game. So a 1-0 win for Liverpool. Let's go back to Sunday's action now, work away in reverse order. Um Briefly, Spurs beat Burnley on, on uh, Sunday, two goals to one. Burnley actually scored a goal away from home. They did lead this game, uh, but alas, it didn't really make a difference because they only ended up losing it 2-1. Deli Ali and Danny Rose with the goals. Uh, bigger result for Spurs, given what happened, which we'll touch on in a minute, with the clubs above them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one point on the Danny Rose goal that I believe Sissoko was very lucky to stay on the field. Unfortunately, I was watching another game that had kicked off at exactly the same time. So I didn't see the whole game, but I did see there was a, uh, yeah, Sissoko's challenge beforehand potentially warranted a red. We've seen them mm. given. It did. I agree. It definitely did. Have you seen it? Uh, I haven't. I've just heard hearsay. It's not, not good. It's really not good. It's been the um, weekend for dodgy challenges, put it that way. It has, hasn't it? It's been quite a few around, actually. Yeah, we'll touch on uh, yeah. a certain Man United player in a minute. Um, <laughs> what, um, quick stat as well. Burnley have only led away from home this season for six minutes. So um, I think it's fair to say their home form will be the important thing in that one. And Spurs winning without Harry Kane on the score sheet, which is, is quite rare as well. So, or a penalty. Or a penalty, absolutely. Yeah. I would, although Dele Alli, of course, you know, still had to score. So he's still involved somewhere or the other. But uh, nevertheless, a good victory for Spurs, which takes them only a point behind their North London rivals, Arsenal, um, which both you and I watched. Uh, they lost to Manchester City. Touching on both sides, Arsenal taking the lead through Theo Walcott's goal early on. And then for the first half, seemed fairly content to just sit on that lead. And I think it's fair to say played fairly well in the first half. What happened during the break? Is it complacency? Do you feel Arsenal just took their foot off the gas? Were they out-tacticed by uh, Man City and, and Pep in the second half? What, what do you make of it? It was a very Jekyll and Hyde performance across the uh, two halves from Arsenal. Um, Manchester City were very... Um, it was very um, a bit like their Leicester City performance, I think I'll describe it. Um, they didn't really want to change it, just continue with what was happening, even though their back line was getting broken very quickly by Arsenal. And they were getting in, but just not clinical enough. Um, then a change came at half-time. And I have to give uh, Pep some credit, bringing on Bakary Sanya um, to quieten Awobi. And the goal coming almost immediately from kickoff didn't help. Um, and I think Arsenal lost their heads. Um, there was, a, I think, a communication issue at the back where they then lost um, the gap between the midfield and the attacking players, which was just too large. And City won the midfield battle and just commenced to grind out the win. Mm, first goal for Leroy Dano as well in that game. Um, this is not genuinely not sour grapes, but would it, I think we'd be remiss to say that or to not mention, I should say, that both goals arguably are offside. I think the Sane one, for me, was the one that was sli- I was slightly more aggrieved about having seen the replay because however much Sky Sports want to convince you otherwise, it is clearly offside. Um, the David Silva one, I as he runs across past the Czech's path, I'm less inclined to be angry about because you see those every week, don't you? Yeah, um, that one, I think his starting position for David Silva is, uh, I think he's onside and I still expect a goalkeeper to save anything at the near post. Mm. Um, and there's Got a couple it. of goalkeepers that have been lauded as world-class that seem to have that as a problem. 
Yeah, I mean, is, it, is he a, a goalkeeper you worry about at, at Arsenal? I mean, taking sort of our loyalties aside, if you will, he he does. I don't know if you agree with this, but to me, he seems a little bit slow in the reaction speed. And is that the age? Because at thirty-four, surely he should be in his prime, if not sort of approaching it. I mean, is that a worry for you? So I think that happens with every player when they get to that age. But what they should have learned by that point is experience, and then be um, instead of having reaction times, using wisdom to make their positioning decisions, and they should be better positioned when the ball comes in. Um, but this is a problem for Petr Cech, and I think he's just not having a great 2016, especially this season. He's uh, been at fault for a couple of things, and I don't think he's communicating with his back four as much as he's done, in, uh, especially last season, where he talked to the defence through quite a few number of games. And this season seemed a little bit, well, especially in this game, a little bit quiet and didn't uh, urge the back four to push up a little bit because that was the source of most of the problems in that game. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And uh, should be noted, he made a couple of very good saves as well. We're not um, throwing him directly into the no. bus. We're, we're just kind of pushing him slightly under, not, not too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, we should give Man City some credit. As you say, Pep Guardiola, um, we'll touch on him later on with the feedback from last week's show. But he, yeah, he, he got things right. You know, I, I felt, I still felt he didn't set the right team up for the first half, but he did make a bit of a tweak. It did seem to change the system, certainly recognised the problems Iwobi was giving <laughs> Sabaleta changed the system and City got the goals. Uh, Raheem Sterling will do his confidence in the world of good. He's been quiet of late. And of course, despite those two big suspensions that everyone, certainly from last perspective, said would affect the game, in the end they didn't. And City second half were quite impressive. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to take anything away from the City performance. It was a fantastic second half from them. And obviously something was said in the dressing room at half time that fired them up. Mm, certainly worked, didn't it? Uh, they sit, of course, um, in second place now as a result uh, of the third. Uh, sorry, sorry, third. Liverpool oh, has just uh, gone above them. You are absolutely correct. My apologies. Liverpool now up to 37 <laughs> points. Um, so they're down to third. So as a result of that, Chelsea had the opportunity on the Saturday. Don't worry, Southampton, Bournemouth, we will be back. Um, but focusing on the top, Chelsea had the opportunity to stretch their lead and they did so. Uh, 1-0 victory over Crystal Palace. I just want to read a few uh, bits to you here with regards to Chelsea's most recent form. Um, if you look at, obviously, their Premier League uh, romp, shall we say, when they went on this winning run, they've won 2 0 at Hull, 3 0 against Leicester, 4 0 against Manchester United, 2 0 Southampton, 5 0 Everton, 1 0 at Middlesbrough, uh, and then 2 1 against Spurs, 3 1 against Man City. Chelsea beat West Brom 1 0, Sunderland 1 0, and Palace 1 0. Three one nils in a row, a lot of clean sheets, but by very sort of, you know, there's, there's a few high scores, but a lot of them have been quite close, tight, ground out results. Any, do you take anything from that? Because Palace weren't bad on the day, but Chelsea seemed to be, dare I say it, Mourinho-esque all of a sudden. I, I think I, I wouldn't call it Mourinho-esque. I'd say it's the hallmark of an Italian manager. Those kind of results sort the defence out first. And then we'll get a goal and sit on it. It's uh, looking back at like the uh, Milan team of the 90s um, and Juventus team under Conte. It's exactly what they do. Get a goal and then done. That's it. You're not getting past us. We've seen it in the Premier League before. You know, the 1-0 to the Arsenal chant is uh, another throwback to a team that would just score a goal and then just say, that's it. We're done. Game over. Shut the game, game down. Over. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, a good win for Chelsea. I mean, the, uh, be honest with you, you know, not not being harsh on Chelsea, there's not a lot else to talk about in this game, other than Diego Costa picking up another yellow card, which means he's now suspended for I think it's just the one game, Boxing Day. Um, yeah. You wouldn't expect it to be too much of an issue as they face Bournemouth at home, but is it possibly a glimpse into maybe the chink in the armour if they do lose him? Of course, they got Michi Batshuayi in reserve. But do you think any prolonged injury to Costa could be a, a bit of a worry for Conte unless he goes shopping in January? Uh, I haven't seen enough, and I don't think anyone has really seen enough of Michi Batshuayi in this formation. Obviously, he came in earlier in the season before they reverted to the back three and the 4-3-3 three, uh, three, three system that they're now using. Um, so I think this next game is going to give us that answer, how he performs against Bournemouth. 
if of course he plays that's the other if, question yes because it'd be very conte to stick sort of victor moses through the middle instead or something um, yeah something random so yeah i think he will play um he's waited his, his waited for his chance patiently and um yeah, I think he probably will get the nod. And obviously, I have seen quite a lot of Michi when he was in France and Marseille. Uh, I have to say, I do think this system will work quite nicely for for him if if Conte um, does allow him to, uh, to to get the nod. So, um, be interesting. Um, well, we shall have to watch that one with close eyes. But another person will have to watch with close eyes. Um, mine and Ross's best mate. It's good old Alan Pardew. Um, <clears throat> I haven't had your views on Mr. Pardew since you've been with us, so. What are your views? And is he a manager that, if he isn't already, should be under a lot of pressure by now? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't particularly... Uh, well, I'm not a huge fan of Alan Pardew, um, potentially from his West Ham days, also as a uh, Brighton fan for his Crystal Palace antics as well. doesn't really put him in the greatest light for me to start <laughs> with. Um, saying that, however, I think he should be under a lot of pressure. Um, he's definitely there on credit for being in that 90, uh, was it 1990 FA Cup final team. That's definitely what's keeping him there at the moment. And Steve Parrish is probably fighting his corner. Um, I don't know if Steve Parrish can take another bullet from their new owners, um, but he's certainly taken enough already for Alan Pardew. And I think his time might be coming and I could see a change coming probably in the new year. Mm, I agree. The figure yeah. of Sam Allardyce is still. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although, what I would say, ironically, is probably the perfect manager for Palace at the moment would be Alan Pardew coming in. <laughs> yeah, I agree. With that. Yeah, <laughs> it's I the exact that manager one. they need. It's that Pulis or Warnock, isn't it? It's yeah. those three of yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, I, here's a left field one for you. What if West Ham Park companies are Slaven Bilic? Oof. Mm. I'm well. Be I'm not sure one. on that one. It'd be interesting for sure. Mm. But, and they've got, is it American owners at Palace of Artists, isn't it, I think? so. Yeah, it's American or Chinese. I'm getting confused what about, now. What about Jürgen Klinsmann? Oh. Oh. Better yes. Than with USA? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, they've... Yeah, he's a man I've been... liked in England for a while. Me too, yeah. I thought he was the right guy for the England manager job, but we won't get into that. Um, a German managing England? Whatever next. Blasphemy. I'd have been fine with it for the record. Um, we had an Italian and it was a similar kind of thing. Yeah, Mancini was the other issue, wasn't it? It uh, didn't come to pass. So, yeah, Pardew under pressure. I don't know if you saw this, but I think it was a... Sw- oh, what was the game Palace won recently? The whole game. And he, yes. I think it was the whole game when he did that awkward sort of thumbs up to Steve Parrish and Parrish sort of sheepishly looked around and gave him an awkward thumbs up back. It was yeah. just cringeworthy television you've ever seen. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's Palace then. Um, so that's your, your top four, top five out the way. Um, coming up on the rails of Manchester United, who have been largely mocked for a long period of time over this season. Um, and there's a certain Swedish striker that a lot of people have said to me for a long time, uh, being a huge fan of him, as of course I am, he won't get more than 10 goals in the Premier League. He'll be a failure. Uh, he won't be able to stand up to the physicality and rigour of the uh, Premier League. Well, he's not doing too bad, is he? Um, Two break, two goals in this game, but a lovely header. But should he have been on the pitch for that second goal? Well, uh, yeah, I thought we'd come on to this. This is a very Ibra-esque uh, challenge. Should, well, I'm not even sure if I should call it a challenge. Very Ibra assault on a man. <laughs> yes. <that's what laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I would have expected him to see a red but he's one of those figures that I think if you're a referee and I, this shouldn't happen but I think he's rather intimidating and probably brings that down by his stature down to a yellow because I couldn't see anyone giving Ibra a red without feeling retribution mm, he has had a I think he I'm trying to think back I've got a terrible memory I do recall him being sent off in France once by a very stern referee very sort of kalina esque who just sort of went I don't care who you are you're off and that was it and I vaguely remember him being sent off for very high feet at one point yeah. which is a bit of a mark of his it's his, kind of his trademark really but yeah, yeah it, it was a it was an agricultural challenge at best I've seen a fantastic um comparison where um to Cantona yes absolutely that that's a yeah. That is exactly the kind of player and exactly the kind of mentality that they've got up front at the moment. Yeah, and he's a very clever centre-forward. He uses his body very, very well, and it's, yeah. it's 
side of his of his game. For the, for the first goal, um, the way he pushes, I think it's Craig Dawson again mm-hmm. out of the way. Uh, Slide just, nudge. Just changes his run a little bit to give himself that extra half a yard mm-hmm. to make sure he's got there to the ball. So yeah. perfect forward play. The Dark Hearts. We like to hear this podcast. <laughs> um, and it brings to an end Tony Pulis's wonderful run because West Brom have been on a charge recently, albeit they had a, a defeat in the middle of their good run, but they've been uh, quietly moving up the table and they still sit in eighth. So I think uh, that's still a pretty good job that Pulis has done there and uh, he'll be looking to um, derail Arsenal further on Boxing Day, uh, yeah. which is not even a thought worth going into. <laughs> Um, let's uh, have a look at some of the other action then moving down the table for the weekend. Let's go back to Sunday and have a look at that South Coast derby. I know Ross is gutted that he, he can't contribute on this podcast about this game, but good three points for Southampton. This in a, Obviously, Bournemouth, we know we saw them against Liverpool a few weeks ago. We know what they can do. Um, they've made that ground a bit of a fortress. I thought from what I saw of this game, albeit catching it 20 minutes into the first half onwards, they, they deserved it overall. I thought they controlled the tempo... Movement was good, um, and that Jay Rodriguez goal, I mean, that's pretty special, isn't it, to wrap it all up? Absolutely. There was some early pressure um, with Bournemouth coming in and getting a very quick first goal. Um, but I think after that, Southampton just settled down. It was a very um, professional uh, result, professional game they played. And yeah, that Jay Rodriguez second goal came out of nowhere. So it's a great goal. Reminded me of, of course, the man will know well. Uh, this is Dennis Bergkamp esque turn and shot, wasn't it? Just sort of Absolutely. that swivel of the hips, and uh, yeah, really. And funnily enough, mentioned Canton, I saw a goal he would have scored as well. Yeah. Really uh, quality strike. And credit to Jay Rodriguez, he's he's had a tough time, obviously battling back from serious injury. He's now getting the games um, that you know probably his fitness has deserved. Now he's got back to fitness. Um, do you think this is potentially a good sign? Because Saints, of course, lost Charlie Austin. Is Jay Rodriguez the man to fill that void now? I think it is. He was their main man um, a couple of seasons ago for the guy up top um, with Graziano Pella. Uh, I think we'd be otherwise seeing someone like maybe Buffal coming into there. Um, but yeah, um, that is his first 90 minutes that he's played since March 2014. And it's good to see a guy who's had a an awful injury and was just getting into the England team at that time. Um, of course so he was, yeah. Get back and uh, bring his career back onto the straight and narrow. I've forgotten all about that, I must admit. Yeah, he was he was definitely yeah. a touted prospect. And I think he had a couple of options to move on loan. I think West Brom and Burnley were sniffing and he's elected to stay and it's paying off. And uh, a word for Sofian Buffal as well, because I know uh, I talked him up big time when, when we signed him. I was saying to Ross, you might like this lad. He might You might quite enjoy him. He's he's a class act. He really is. He's he's still a little bit raw. He's still finding his feet, but just touches on the ball in that game. Oh, he's a lovely player. Not so keen on the dive, I have to stress. Mm. But having watched him for three and a bit seasons, he's got that in him, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. But um, a good win for Saints. And uh, Eddie Howe, yeah, he'll be, unlucky. he'll be unfortunate. But I think if you'd have said to Eddie Howe, you'd be 10th at Christmas, he'd have taken that. So fair play to, to Bournemouth and their ongoing season. Um, so we will also touch on uh, the uh, the game between West Ham and Hull very quickly. Um, not a lot to talk about other than the fact that apparently, I must confess, I haven't seen all the highlights of this game. I know Hull were massively unlucky. I think they hit the woodwork three times and possibly could have had a penalty. And there's a lot of talk that Mark Noble's winner from a penalty was potentially not a penalty. So... Any sort of thoughts on, on, on this? I know you didn't see the highlights of this one either, but is it a case of West Ham getting back on the right right lines or is it a case of just unlucky Hull again? I think this certainly takes a little bit of pressure off Slavin Bilic. Uh, I think if any team loses to Hull City in this season, um, especially if they're currently in a perilous position themselves, then the manager's head is going to be called for at that time. Um so it's something that West Ham needs to get done, uh, especially at the Olympic Stadium. That's going to help towards uh, breaking that hoodoo they've got of playing in front of that crowd, albeit the crowd now in a separate postcode uh, from certain stands. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a good win for them, however scrappy. Yeah, little stat here for you. Mark Noble, do you know, he's taken 32 penalties. He scored 28 and only missed twice in eight years. That's quite impressive, isn't it? 
That is very impressive. It's not quite Matt Letizia levels, but um, it's still pretty impressive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good win for West Ham, as they say, and, and a whole, oh, the longer time goes on, the more I look at Hull, and I just don't see them mm. staying up. I mean, they need major surgery in January, but of course, this, this looming issue, the takeover, the owners, and I'll be honest with you, I don't see Terry Phelan, Terry Phelan, I keep saying that, Mike Phelan, um, I don't see him employed much into the new year, if I'm honest. I just don't, I think it's going to be new owners, uh, just to coincide with the transfer window, new manager, and away we go. I don't know if you see it the same way. Yeah, I could see that happening. Um, I would like to see Mike Phelan actually given a chance this is his first managerial job after stepping out of the shadows of um sir alex ferguson um so it would be good to see what he can do um especially as a a young brit i say young a british manager and uh we want to make sure that we're keeping that talent and honing it true yeah, true. It's uh, pressure, pressure galore, especially when you're bottom of the league. And uh, mm. that will also be a, a tag levelled at Bob Bradley. I sent an interesting tweet for my personal account out late Saturday night and got very mixed responses. Um, I personally think that, um, well, obviously, Bob Bradley, I should say Middlesbrough won this game three goals to nil. Um, and fair play, Middlesbrough very good on the day. I think it's the first time they scored three for quite a while. Um, but yeah, just focusing on Swans. I mean, they're second bottom now. There's a lot of pressure on Bradley, even from his own owners who employed him less than what two months ago. I said, tweeted on Saturday. I, I think it's scandalous if if they sack him this early without a transfer window, without real time to bed in his ideas. Uh, as I say, I've got a very mixed response from both Arsenal fans and Swansea fans because obviously a lot of Arsenal fans tend to follow me. Um, what's your sort of take on it? Because I know this is a bit of a sore subject, but I can't help but think the xenophobia, and I do call it that because I think that's what it is, is is not helping the situation. All the PK references and the American accent, accent you know, issues. I just don't, it doesn't sit well with me. I don't know about you. Uh, yeah, I'd agree. The uh, visceral coming out from the uh, the media, especially those who had tipped uh, friends to take the position. Uh, <coughs> right. All those, yeah with no prior managerial experience. Yeah. The, the, uh, you probably would know a bit more about Paul Bradley uh, with his escapades in France. Indeed. Um, was it Le Havre? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Very unlucky not to get promoted last year. One goal short. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So he does know how to, you know, manage a team. Um, and I think just, yeah, as you say, give him a transfer window. That squad isn't great. And he's, he said that before, that he hasn't got the right players in order to fulfil what his philosophy. Um, and I think that just needs to happen. Swansea have uh, turned the mentality of how they're uh, hiring managers. Um, we used to say they were quite a stable club and would hold on to people and, not, and generally make the right decisions with their managers from back with Brendan Rodgers and uh, Martinez was there as well and uh, Michael Laundrup mm. and I think they just just need to be a bit more patient um, and uh, get away from that trigger just Great. for a little bit can't help but wonder if Gary Monk hadn't had that <coughs> altercation with was it Ashley Williams and then folding a brick at a training ground who was that that involved it was a foreign uh-huh. player can't think of the life of me. Uh, Chico Sanchez Flores. That's the badger. Go with the ponytail. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't help but think that's where it went wrong for Gary Monk. And it's a shame that, you know, I'm not saying Gary Monk is the second coming of Jesus as far as managers goes, but he seemed to be, he seemed to have the right ethos at Swansea. He seemed to be the right man there. And I can't help but think, like you say, since Hugh Jenkins has parted power with the company at the top of Swansea, they seem to have gone off the rails. And I think you make an excellent point. When you say that, I, I like Francesco Guidelin, but it was a weird appointment when he came in. It was an even weirder one when they kept him on. And mm. that squad hasn't been very good for at least 18 months. And I think Bradley deserves the, the chance to, A, sign his son in the transfer window, which, of course, I'm sure will happen, <laughs> uh, Michael Bradley. And uh, and I think, he, yeah, I, you know, some of the players he's looking at, I think they, they could be really good players for Swansea. So, um, and any club that's got Gilfie Sigurdsson has half a chance of staying up, in my opinion. So we'll keep a close eye on them. And briefly, we should touch on Middlesbrough to say three goals for them in this game. Uh, they're not a free scoring side. A few of them, their um, supporters are getting a little bit restless, but two goals for, for Alvaro Negredo and one from John's, John's little mate, Martin Darun, who was formerly at Atalanta last season. Uh, 3-0 victory. 
it's a result they needed, isn't it? Because they were starting to look over their shoulders a bit. Yeah, um, Negredo back to goal scoring form after being very quiet for uh, most of the season. Um, and we've got, yeah, the challenge from Amat, which I'd like to talk about, which mm-hmm. led to the, the penalty. That's one of the laziest challenges I think I've ever seen and is probably one of the reasons that Bob Bradley, if he had any hair, would be tearing it out. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It was so poor, wasn't it? So uh, poor. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, just... In, in the weekend where certain players have been questioned about their appetite to run around a lot, um, that was an appetite to not making a proper challenge or committing to one. Absolutely. Yeah, really, really poor. Um, but yeah, good result for Middlesbrough. That takes them, uh, what, four points clear of the drop zone at the moment. So you've got to think they've got to win their home games. Um, elsewhere, we saw on the Saturday is one of the game I want to focus on quite heavily which was the um we'll just briefly say Sunderland won by a goal to nil against Watford um no offense Sunderland fans there just wasn't a lot to talk about but a good win nevertheless for them and uh David Moyes is seemingly slowly getting the home form sorted which is a good start and Patrick Van Arnhelt the man who should never be in a defense but likes to score going forward uh, got the winner in that yeah. game and a uh, good result for Sunderland but the other game Big incident in this one. Uh, Leicester and Stoke, 2-2 draw. Um, Stoke City, 2-0 up and cruising. And Leicester City came back to draw two, despite having 10 men and seven, yes, seven players booked. Um, Let's get straight to it. Jamie Vardy, uh, read for you or not? Yes, uh, I don't understand what uh, other pundits have been saying, where they say it's not a red card, or in the case of Danny Murphy saying it was a good challenge on match of the day on Saturday evening, which... Did he say that? Yeah, potentially in his day, yeah, you'd say that's a good challenge, but we live in a modern era where two-fitted challenges are outlawed because one too many players' legs got broken, they thought, well, I should probably put a stop to that. Um, So, yeah, uh, I can't see why there's any um, case to defend him for that challenge. Yes, he's, uh, say he was, a uh, how would you describe it? Probably the defender with him, gave him a little tug on his shirt, which could put him off, but still doesn't defend the fact that he's launched in with two feet, that he can still do that without being pulled back by a defender. Um, and just to add to the whole atmosphere, the, um, Leicester City fans at half time throwing coins. At, yeah. uh, it was Craig Paulson, wasn't it? The referee. Yes. Uh, Same ref- absolute, absolutely disgusting. Um, there's, there's no reason for it. Uh, even if you don't like the result or the, uh, or what he's done, I'm sure there's a, there'll be plenty of Leicester City fans once they've calmed down and watched the challenge to completely agree with him. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I can't condone that. No, no, it's the same ref, of course, that haven't sent off Marcus Rojo in the previous game. But even so, I mean, and and I tweeted uh, again about this. And again, I got a very mixed response. Um, I was saying that um, there's two things that were key for the, for this challenge. Um, a, I don't think Jamie Vardy is the sharpest knife in, in the draw, if I'm honest. Um, because surely anybody with an ounce of intelligence would have known that having what, having what had gone on with Rojo in the two previous games referees were going to be on the lookout for out of control challenges um and the also thing to add to that is as you say yes some people have said to me well he doesn't jump in with two feet he jumps with two feet and then leans with one foot i don't care whether you jump in with two feet or not the minute you leave the ground with two feet you're out of control and if you pull one leg back that's all well and good but you still follow through and you still put two feet off the ground as you've made the approach which is where the ferocity of the challenge is and it clearly was a challenge made out of frustration but as you rightly say it doesn't excuse it so for me no. red as well should give yeah. Leicester some credit though coming back to absolutely uh, with uh, big lower sorry. yeah big Ulloa. um a man that I will have to uh, confess, I never really rated at Brighton. He uh, <laughs> he slowed our play down too much, I thought, personally, when we had him in the team. Uh, but fair play to him. He could always score a header. And um, Damari Gray coming on as well. Uh, what a fantastic young player he is. He's a player, isn't he? Uh, I can't understand why he doesn't start. I really can't. No, he was absolutely wonderful at uh, Birmingham City beforehand. Mm where they got him from, and he was touted by a, a lot of bigger sides than Leicester City, Yeah, put it that way. And um, yeah, I think he's made a wise choice going to Leicester. He's got a chance to play in the Champions League very early on in his career, but with a lot of pressure off. 
I thought you were going to say the championship then. No. <laughs> Although it may be. I mean, you never know. Yeah. But yeah, no, I agree. I think he, he's gone to the right club rather than doing what I would call like a Will Saha, going at a big club too early and yeah. having to rebuild. So, um, yeah, but I must admit, uh, I say I put him in my fantasy team at the start of the season. I only took him out because he just hasn't played. But mm. he's uh, he's a hugely talented player. Always excites me when I watch him. So, uh, yeah, he's one to watch. And, uh, yeah, credit to Leicester. I think Mark Hughes and Stoke will be bitterly disappointed to chuck that away. 2-0 up and uh, Stoke sitting 11th uh, you think they're fairly safe but don't want to get on too sticky a run so uh, and that was the um, the weekend's fixtures then I'm pretty sure we've covered them all I don't think we've missed any uh, so let's have a, a quick look at the table uh, before we look ahead to the fixtures which of course the next fixtures will be on Boxing Day it will be after Christmas boys and girls uh, so we've got Chelsea top of the league 43 points on 17 having 17 games played only two defeats all season Manchester City sits uh, Sorry, Liverpool sits second. Let's update the table on 37 points with their win after the Merseyside derby tonight. Man City sitting third on 36 points and a horrible week for Arsenal that saw them lose twice away. Uh, leaves them way off the pace now in 34 points. Uh, Tottenham closing the gap to 33 on fifth and Manchester United into the top six on 30 with Southampton, West Brom, Everton and Bournemouth making up the top 10. Down at the bottom, Stoke, Watford, West Ham, Middlesbrough down to 14th and then you've got the teams in a bit of a, a cluster for those relegation spots. Leicester and Burnley for 15th to 16th, just above Palace on 15 points and 17th. Sunderland in the bottom three on eight on uh, 14 points from uh, on 18th place that is, and Swansea and Hull rooted both on 12 points, 19th and 20th respectively, with Hull City bottom on goal difference. Uh, let's have a look ahead at these Boxing Day fixtures. Then, uh, any of these that jump off the page at you? Uh, there's only one that. It might not be the most exciting game, and it will sound very biased, but I can't believe this game has been put in for Boxing Day. Arsenal West Brom. Mm. So how the Birmingham people from yeah Birmingham are going to be expected to get to London on a Boxing Day kickoff seems absolutely absurd to me. But we I think we've run out of London teams to play, and they've just got the uh, short straw of mm. uh, having to come down. I would have thought. Maybe the fixture computer would have uh, would have changed a little bit, and maybe they had a look into that one. But mm. Otherwise, Leicester Everton, I think that's the big one. Yeah, it's tasty that actually, isn't it? It's Leicester at home, and you think they've got to be winning that. And Everton, another defeat could see them further down the table. Yeah, yeah. it is a biggie. There's there's a couple of games, of course, the days after. We should say Liverpool Stoke is the day after, and uh, Southampton yeah. Spurs on the Wednesday. That's quite a biggie as well, I think, because um, Spurs, I. You know, decent on the road, but I would fancy Saints to get something from that game. Uh, maybe that's my bias coming through again, but um, yeah, I think that should be a decent watch as well. Yeah, it's a good opportunity for Southampton to start getting back towards those uh, Europa League places. Mm, get back to where they uh, where they were at the start of the season. Yeah. Um, look, looking at the fixtures in full, then we've got Watford Palace. That's quite a biggie, actually, when you think about it. Mm. Um, Arsenal West Brom, as you said, Burnley Middlesbrough, Chelsea Bournemouth, Leicester Everton, Manchester United Sunderland. Swansea West Ham also quite a big one in the context yeah. Hull City Manchester City is the late game and then you say Liverpool Stoke the day after Southampton Spurs the day after that and then we've got Friday night football uh, Hull City and Everton before another another weekend uh, fixture list comes into view on the Saturdays it's all go this time of year and we'll touch on our um, we'll touch on our uh, our poll that we put out about podcasts in a moment um, and also just to mention uh, Ross has just uh, give me a notice here. Southampton players have been given three days off after nine games in 30 days. That is nuts. <laughs> that is absolutely crackers. Nine games yeah. in 30 days. Even though they paid a lot of money for it, that's ridiculous. That is the Europa League for you. Yes, tell me about it. Yeah, not that I've ever played in it myself. Mm. Okay, um, right, you're going to um, do your very best to uh, to fill in for Ross at this point um, because we're going to try and botch our way through the... Um, I, I'm going to look after League 1 and League 2, so don't worry about that. But Championship, um, how is it going? Um, first of all, Brighton. Uh, obviously, everybody knows you have a close allegiance to them. Uh what a win that was to ruin Gianfranco Zola's day with a very late winner. How did you, uh, how did you see it and what was your emotions watching that? Uh, it was an absolutely uh, irritating game for Brighton because we were absolutely brilliant through it uh, with um, Birmingham trying to get into the game, but Duffy and Dunk were doing a superb job at keeping, and this is where I'm going to Danny his name, uh, 
Mikhailovitz. I think uh, that's how it's. Dukovic, isn't it? Is that the ex Yes, the big yeah, bloke Dukovic's. up front. That's that the that one. one. <laughs> We're keeping him quiet for a bit. Um, we were doing quite well until the 52nd minute, and he won probably his first header of the game, which meant anything, and he puts it in the back of the net. Um, yeah, and after that, you're thinking, what's going to happen? Um, Birmingham were absolutely dominant in that game, and it changed when probably a player who both Frost and I and perhaps yourself, Chris, do absolutely love, Solly March, came on and uh, changed the game. To be honest, uh, Anthony Knockhart getting the uh, first goal, I believe, after the uh, two uh, bereavements he's had recently. So dedicating that goal to his father, which was uh, a great thing to see. And that just spurred Brighton on. Um, Solly March again, at the thick of the action, getting the ball in. And uh, Glenn Murray sticking it in the back of the net for a, a 90, I think it was a 94th minute winner. It's almost the last kick of the game for him to snatch the win and uh, that's very a very welcome win uh, especially as uh, Newcastle also got a win just need to make sure we're still in touching distance mm. of the Magpies Do you um, are you quietly confident I don't want to jinx it but based on what you've seen so far are you quietly confident this is finally the year that Brighton get up because it would be nice to see them because they've come so close so many times it would be nice to see them up yeah, I don't want to jinx it because I'm prone to, um, but it is looking very good at the moment. Um, the only uh, team that looked to be threatening us in that position was another team that benefited from a 90-plus minute winner in Reading, um, who also got a late winner in their game. Um, mm. They are eight points behind, but we know what the championship is like. Anybody can beat anybody and someone will inevitably go on a run. Mm, this is uh, this is why Ross loves the league. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Why not? Who's going to go on the run? Because my limited knowledge, granted, I've been trying my best to keep up because I've been dragging Ross into Liga, so I'm <laughs> dragging myself into the championship. Of the sides I've seen of late, the, the teams I'm keeping an eye on, Fulham, just because I rather ludicrously said they'd go up in our preseason preview. Yes, I know. Um, but quietly unbeaten in four, you know, unpredictable, but I'm keeping an eye. And the other two that jump off the page at me, really, are Leeds United and Sheffield Wednesday. They're the two that seem to be actually Derby as well. Five wins from six, is it? Are the ones yeah. to draw? I mean, pfft. any others that, that sort of look you look at and you go, yeah, I could see them putting a run together? Yeah, Leeds are very, very quietly going about their business. Like we said about Gary Monk, he's just... You know, there was cha- uh, talk of Cellino going a bit mad and uh, getting rid of him after uh, a couple of uh, couple of games and a couple of dodgy uh, results. But the one for me as a dark horse, now that there is a very good manager available, and if he comes in, Norwich, if they get rid of Alex Neal and bring in Gary Rowett, I think oh, we could see that. And Norwich just climbing up the table. Um Aston Villa, yeah, Aston Villa are going quietly about their business. Um, and I think we could see them tugging on the uh, coattails of the uh, of sixth position come mm-hmm. the end of the season. But I think if Gary Rout comes into uh, Norwich City, I think we could see something special there. True. Or, of course, and we should say, of course, if people don't know, Gary Rout was relieved of his duties at Birmingham um, with Gianfranco Zola coming in. Fair to say, Birmingham fans are not exactly chuffed with it. And I think he's been hugely hard done by because he's done a magnificent job at Birmingham. Um, and there's there's a lot of talk that Gary Rout might be interested in, in a potential vacant post at the team in fourth place, um, who are Huddersfield Town, who they got a... Um, they got a win at the weekend uh, as he frantically searches through the fixtures to see who it was they beat. Oh, Norwich, wasn't it, on Friday night? Yes. Um, by two goals to one. There's a lot of talk that their manager is uh, is off to Wolfsburg in Germany, which I'm sure myself and Drew will discuss in the weekly pod later on in the week. But, um, yeah, it, it seems that David Wagner, who's sort of mini Klopp, as it were, could be on his way to Wolfsburg. If that happens, Huddersfield have the door wide open um, is Gary Rowett maybe would he look at that job because it's uh, Huddersfield and Birmingham oh my job if he's terrible it's up north um, 
not far for him to go, you'd think. He's had experience at Burton as well. Obviously played at, at Derby and, uh, and and Birmingham. So do you think that might might appeal to him a bit more than dropping down to a club with such uh, lofty ambitions as Norwich? Yeah, he's he's not a manager that's going to be out of a job for very long. I'll put it that way. But uh, I think he does hold a very strong deck of cards for where he can pick. Uh, I think he'll just look at it and see what the uh, what projects are on the table. I think being offered a little bit more money with uh, Norwich in terms of a transfer budget might be uh, a better option for him if he sees the sights of uh, taking a team up to the Premier League. I think he might be better off achieving that with Norwich rather than yeah. uh, Huddersfield. But as you say, uh, geography also comes into it and being based around the north. Uh, that's going to, in the Midlands, he's going to potentially look at that rather than going out to East Anglia. Mm. Yeah, so it's a tough one, isn't it? We should I, we should probably look at some of the other results as well, of course, from the weekend. Um, Blackburn Rovers, another manager under pressure there in Owen Coyle, losing, as you say, at home to Reading 3-2. Bristol City losing at home, surprisingly, a little bit to Preston, who are quietly impressing a few. I'm beating in three games now as well. Um, but now I've been losing to Newcastle, as you said. Fair enough, that. Yeah. Cardiff City, 4-3 uh, defeat at home to Barnsley. I think it was a last-minute goal in that game, I'm pretty sure, for Barnsley. Um, yeah, it was. It's, uh, it is the weekend in the Championship for a 90th-minute winner. I believe was there it? is about five of them in the Championship mm. this weekend. Yeah, I think that's 90th-minute right. goals. I mean, that puts uh, Neil Warnock is under a bit of pressure there. Or, I mean, he isn't personally, but I, 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 th- I said when he came in, I said put a fiver on Cardiff to go up. And the way the championship is, he still could. But yeah. they, they have fallen off somewhat recently. Um, Fulham Derby 2-2, Leeds beating Brentford 1-0. Nottingham Forest losing at home again to Wolves. All of a sudden, Montagnier has lost the rails a little bit again after a, a mm-hmm. decent run. It's all gone a bit wobbly. Uh, Wolves... Going the other way, Sheffield Wednesday, last minute winner, as you say, against Rotherham. Yeah. That was a penalty in that game, I think. Last, it last was, minute. yeah, Stephen Fletcher converting that. Um, yeah, it was a, another 90th minute winner. Big that derby, seen. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, big derby. And, uh, Wigan losing at home to Ipswich, somewhat maybe surprisingly, although given Wigan's league position, maybe it's not a huge surprise. Uh, 3-2, and then as you say, the Brighton game. And, and uh, Villa winning on Sunday, QPR, uh, the victims this time. QPR... Goodness me, what is going on at QPR? Five straight defeats. They are falling like a stone down the championship. Obviously, they sacked Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank um, earlier on in the season. I look at their squad and I cannot understand how they're that low. I know it's not supremely talented, but you look at the likes of Sandro, Jamie Mackey, um, Connor Washington, who's at the front, I think they got from Peterborough, um, Carl Henry, again, not the most talented player, but do a job, as the old saying goes. Um, Idrisa Silla, Maxim Luongo, uh, Cherry's a decent player. And that defence, yeah. especially. Perch, Kolka, Lynch, Onuha, they're not yeah. bad players. I mean, what what's going on? It's something that I think we've uh, said for about the past four or five seasons, ever since they've been in the Premier League, is what are QPR doing? Mm-hmm. There's, there's something uh, a bit wrong um, in that club from top to bottom. Um yeah, as you say, you keep going through that list. Even the goalkeeper, Alex Smithies, was doing a great job at, uh, I believe, Huddersfield was beforehand. He was a very promising goalkeeper mm. at the time. Um, and yeah, that, that team is just full of, I think we probably have to start calling them uh, journeymen and mercenaries. Yes, and that is what Ian Holloway is trying to um, shift on, isn't it? I think, yeah. I think he's, he said in January it needs a whole clean out of players, and um, they seem to clean up players faster than I clean up my cupboard, my cupboards on a regular basis. But yeah, it's a bit of a mess at QPR. We should just touch on the table. Um, Newcastle obviously say a top by a point from Brighton on 48, but they are eight clear of Reading in the playoffs, along with Huddersfield, Leeds, and Sheffield Wednesday, with Derby, Birmingham, Fulham, and Norwich making up the top ten. Uh, down at the bottom, Rotherham bottom they look doomed to be honest 10 points only from their 22 games uh wigan and blackburn scrapping out the other bottom two places with burton albion cardiff and qpr looking over their shoulders um two to three wins gets you from the bottom three into the playoffs it's nuts uh well just outside the playoffs i should be fair absolutely 
crackers um just a quick look ahead to the fixtures that we've got upcoming of course the championship also goes into overdrive this time of year um looking down the list monday the 26th obviously boxing day again full list of fixtures um the one that sort of jumps off the page is newcastle Sheffield wednesday that's the evening game um your brighton host qpr on on the tuesday afterwards derby birmingham is tasty as is aston villa leeds on the thursday um and Brentford Cardiff could be a big one on Boxing Day as well. Any others that you look at on that list? Uh, Reading Norwich, I think Ooh, that yes. could see um, Alex Neil unfortunately be giving in a, a a bit of coal for Christmas Day. <laughs> yeah, good shout. Yeah, in terms of a P forty five, but we sh- we should see. Um, that looks an interesting game for reasons off the field. Mm. Yeah, managerial changes. Ahoy, mm. we uh, we think yes. Tis okay. the season. Yeah, tis the season to get fired. <laughs> uh, let's um, let's have a quick look at League One and League Two. Now, I apologise for any of our League One, League Two fan followers. Um, this is going to be very brief and probably really badly done. So I apologise in advance. But uh, looking at League One, the leaders are Scunthorpe United, 47 points from their 22 games played. Um, they are looking fairly good bets to uh, to go up this season. I think it would probably be fair to say. Anyway, um, they got a victory this weekend over Millwall, three goals to nil. Decent result that. Sheffield United, one of the form sides of the uh, of the league as well. They're in second place. Um, they got uh, they got another victory themselves this weekend as well. Uh, I've lost who they played. Coventry, of course, on the Thursday. That was the Thursday night football two one there. Um, Bolt Wanderers uh, off the back of four straight wins. They um, they lost this weekend. Um, somewhat surprisingly to Chesterfield, um, one goal to nil. So that slightly derails them, but they're in third. Uh, Bradford, Rochdale, Peterborough, Southend, and Fleet would make up the top end, top eight. Southend are on a decent run themselves. Actually, three wins and two draws from the last five. They're one of the form sides. Peterborough, Rochdale, only one defeat between those two over, over their last, last five games as well. Uh, looking down the table, some big names down there. Charlton, 13th. Uh, Millwall, 14th. Milton Keynes, Don's 18th. Swindon, yes. Uh, Tactics Tim, doing a wonderful job in 19th. Crikey. Uh, and down the bottom, Berry and Coventry, five straight defeats for both. Wow. Oldham are actually bottom of the table. Uh, two defeats and three draws in their last five. Was it Berry that changed their manager this week? I think it's 13 defeats for Berry now. And I'm sure I saw this stat. I think it's on Soccer Saturday on Sky that they they'd uh, they hadn't they haven't won these thirteen games lost thirteen straight they were in the playoffs I think they were second and then they've just gone on this utterly nuts run of losing thirteen games on the spin how do you think that happens at a top level club I mean is it, is it purely confidence well it, it basically perhaps they were in a false position to start with in September when they were sitting up in second um, but looking at their the squad, there's nothing, there's not many players on there that I would look to say, oh yeah, that's uh, I think probably Neil Dance. It's probably up there as the player that I can, uh, oh, yeah. Dixon or two who I believe it's Palace. Dixon. Mm. Yeah, there's a couple of uh, decent players in there, but yeah, you've got to question what's going on at that club and they have tried to change the manager, but maybe it's something else that's going on. Mm. Talk of uh, talk of Phil Neville managing. Last time I heard, so I don't know whether uh, I don't know whether they've, I, I don't believe at the time of recording they've actually got the new manager in. I, I could be wrong on that, so if I am, I apologise. But um, yeah, uh, David Flickcroft was the the man who was sacked from Berry, of course. Um, so that will be a struggle for them. Um, and apparently they've had uh, see breaking news. This is why, um, even though he's in his sick bed, Ross is still with us. Uh, apparently, seventy applications and nobody was suitable. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, Josh, but I thought me and you were perfect candidates for the job. I'm surprised we didn't get accepted, really. Yeah, was this the one that they said they would refuse to take any applications if you used Football Manager as a... That's right, uh, yes, that's right. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, maybe that was it. I'd be all right, as would you, because we're FIFA people. So, you know, I mean, (laughs) that seems perfectly good enough to me. Uh, I'd I'd do a job there. I was thinking about applying for the England 21 job, but I think I'm overqualified. (laughs) 
anyway, uh, so that's uh, that's League One. Um, apologies, but we're not going to go through the fixtures just because I, I I don't want to do the disservice of knowing who's playing who and giving you a big build up because I don't know. So let's just move on to League Two. Well, I do know a little bit. I know that uh, good old Plymouth Argyle are are uh, top of the league once again, uh, back on top. Uh, had a really tough run the last month or so, but um, two wins on the spin. I spoke to my friend living down here in Plymouth uh, who went to the game and he said it was a classic performance of champions ground out the result were poor for long long periods but got the goal and uh, are back to the top of league two on 44 points and that was an away win at Accrington by the way Um, Carlisle United hot on the heels uh, in second place Uh, three wins and two draws in their last five uh, motoring up the table as are Doncaster who despite one blemish in the last five they've won four of those so they're on a bit of a run Portsmouth um, disappointing nil nil draw at home to Hartlepool mainly because I would have won a fairly nice sum of money had they have scored just one goal not that I'm bitter at all in that uh, accumulator I had on board but still thanks for that Pompey uh, in a game that I think saw 12 minutes of injury time at the end of the game nuts but uh, yes Portsmouth um are up to fourth. Luton, Wickham, Cambridge and Blackpool just outside the playoffs. Wickham are on an absolute tear. They've won five on the spin, uh, the latest of which was a victory on Saturday over late Orient. A uh, goal to nil. Uh, Cambridge also four wins from their last five as well, doing all right. Down at the bottom, Newport are looking a little cut adrift. 17 points, four points away from Cheltenham and Accrington are in the, uh, the danger zones as well. Two going down, of course, from League Two. Uh, late Orient, they're a crisis club. Notts County, five defeats on the spin. Morecambe and Hartlepool, Mansfield, all looking over their shoulders. This is one of those divisions, Josh. I don't know if you've seen the table where you could win. Uh, let me have a look. Mansfield in 17th. Subject to other results, they could win two games. Yes, two games and be seventh. I mean, that is crackers. Absolutely crackers. But you can see why yeah, people so- like the lower league. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's one of those great things about English football as well is that most cities within at least 10, 15 miles of where you live will have a professional football team somewhere mm. and you can happily follow them and see them have good escapades. Even Nor- uh, Newport, sorry, have got a uh, FA Cup fixture, haven't they? Um, coming yeah, up with, in a good couple of weeks mm. um, where the winner faces, I believe, Liverpool. Yes, yeah, a lot of so, uh, Plymouth is getting very excited down here at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, even if you don't get a good, decent league run, there's always the magical FA Cup to uh, give you some joy during the winter months. Agreed. And if you are a, a person who listens to this podcast and you're going to your local team, perhaps over the festive period, which is when people get a bit sick of their family and think, right, football, where can I go? Let's just get on the road. So if you are going to a game, um, let us know. Give us a tweet at the FH podcast or drop us a line on email. Send us a few pictures if you like. We'll, uh, we'll retweet them for you. I know we've got a few people who follow championship sides. Um, our good old friend Jake Bayliss has just written us another blog, which I will be getting up very soon um, over the festive period. Period, so you can have a read of that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of people who follow the um, the lower leagues and, and certain clubs of the lower leagues. So if you do follow a team, let us know who they are, and we'll give you a little shout out. We say it every week. Nobody ever lets us know, but if you want to, then do it, and we'll give you a little <laughs> shout out on this podcast. I should say as well, Jake Bayliss's blog um, that is upcoming. Um, it's called Brits Abroad. Um, so no surprises what Jake's blog is about uh, it is indeed about some Brits abroad so it should be a good read that so uh, in fact it is because I've read it so that'll be out soon stay tuned to our Twitter feed for that right um, we are going to jet in a second uh, but there's a couple of bits of admin to let you all know about obviously we've let you know Josh is on board full time um, we should also let you know that as a result of this podcast coming out today uh, this should be released Monday evening at the time of recording late Monday evening, I should say, the main Hip Football Hipsters podcast will resume. However, this week we're going to do things a bit differently because this week sees the uh, sees the closure of a lot of our leagues in Europe. We haven't got a lot to talk about. So what we're going to do is we're going to record a podcast on Friday. Yes, Friday. I know, nuts. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a little chat about, because I think Serie A, Liga, and uh, Bundesliga wrap up. I think La Liga still got another week. Um, 
Josh, you can look that up for me if you if you really want to. But I think there's another week of La Liga. I know there's Copa del Rey this week. So Serie A wraps up on Thursday. So we figured let's give it 24 hours and we'll try and cram all of last weekend's games and this week's games into one podcast. And the plan is that we are... Uh, we're going to do a bit of a bumper edition. So it might be a long podcast. I'll give you a heads up now. We might be looking at sort of two hours, but hopefully it will give you all something uh, something to enjoy over the festive period in our absence. And Josh, we are we had we did a little poll, didn't we, um, during the uh, – oh, they are done, are they, Josh? Thank you for that. Um, are they, fin- are they, is La Liga done for the year now then, is it? La Liga's done and Serie A's just got one. Ah, then one my apologies. Left. So it's just the one round for Bundesliga, Serie A and Liga on before the uh, closure for the winter break. So La Liga is done. Um, yes, over the um, period, Josh, we, over the festive period, we put out a poll recently, uh, which we tend to do from time to time to get your thoughts on what you like or what you don't like. We asked you about whether you enjoyed the podcast last week, the main podcast, because we changed the format slightly. Uh, 31% of you said you loved it. 19% of you said you preferred it before. And 50% of you said, I don't care. Works either way for me. So we're going to just do a little test run for a few weeks and maybe try it the way we did last week for a few weeks. Um, If you do miss the old way, let us know. If you kind of like the new way we'll carry on as we do and we also asked you about the uh the poll last week about the english breakfast pods do you want us to do more do you want us to take a break um you said you'd like us to do a few more english breakfast pods overall the uh, the majority said that so now we've got josh on board uh and obviously with hopefully getting ross back to full fitness we are uh, we're planning i think the loose plan is we'll try and do two Uh, I think that's realistic over the Christmas period. So we're not sure when it's probably going to be off on a bit of a whim when we record them. Just stay tuned to at the FH podcast. We will, of course, release and that will drop into your SoundCloud, iTunes and all that jazz um, soon. So that's the plan. So stay tuned. And uh, if we can make it work, because we've all got families that, you know, we have to see over this Christmas period of time, we'll try and make it work for you. Right. I think think i've covered everything is there anything i've forgotten well there's one person i've forgotten um let's see how he's feeling very briefly because uh he put he's put a lot of work into this podcast over the year and he hates missing it um ross are you alive yeah please don't run I, i'm actually okay <laughs> you you i think it's fair to say if our listeners doubted you and thought you were out making millions they can hear your voice, and I think it's fair to say they probably believe you now. With that, <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm all, I'm all kinds of ruined this weekend, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting better. At least Southampton made you smile. That's yeah, amazing. That was, that, that was at least the one glimmer from the weekend. It's, it's almost karma, isn't it? You can't have Jay Rodriguez score goals like that and then not be ill for a week. That's how it works. I should know. Uh, but um, yes, we'll get well soon, uh, and I'm sure you're happy to have Josh aboard because I know you like to have a little bit of a bit of a review chat between the three of us so uh yeah absolutely i've been sat here listening for the past hour and josh fantastic full debut thank you very much there you go we'll uh, we'll get you some contracts uh in the post tomorrow morning josh you can sign off on those and away you go so there we go okay right well um thank you ross back to bed for you and uh you'll be back i'm sure in full health once we get another pod under our belt soon so you will return um as i say usually you can uh, you can ask us a question if you've got any and that's where we're going to finish this week's show because we've just got two quick questions uh so we're going to give those the time they deserve uh, one is from our good friend and josh's good friend stefan stefan selby um he says hi hipsters he sent us an email by the way which you can do the football hipsters podcast at gmail.com email still works you know uh my mate at work is a brentford fan he loves talking about his team and they're in the championship and he really enjoys it much more in he really enjoyed it sorry much more in league one uh what do you think of the diff- difficulties on getting promoted from league one to the championship it is just as big a jump from the championship to the premier league he says my name my mate's name is dan chalky please give him a shout out i got him listening to the show a few weeks ago and he's loving it well we will talk about dan because he asks us a question as well but what do you reckon to that, Josh? Do you think that's uh, do you, do you, what is it about sort of clubs liking the the lower leagues more? Because I think as a Middlesbrough fan came on six or six that he enjoyed Middlesbrough in the Championship more than he did in the Premier League. And you know what is it about being in the lower leagues that sort of entices people so much? Well, I'm sure you enjoy whichever league your team's playing in where they're winning the most, and that probably covers both Brentford and uh, Middlesbrough. Um, 
Brentford doing absolutely fantastically under Mark Warburton in uh, League One. Um, and then coming up to the championship, and they nearly went up in their first season, a bit like um, Southampton did and um, Brighton nearly did in their first seasons um, in the championship after coming straight up from League One. Um, I can I can get what they're going on. I think um, Brentford particularly have kind of stagnated now because uh, they obviously under Mark Warburton they were doing tremendously well, and it was a travesty when they decided to uh, move him on not fulfilling the potential and I think they're um, currently dealing the consequences of that um, yeah the, the, the drop to the championship or the you know the the, the championship up to the the Premier League do you, is, it, is it a bigger jump as people sort of perceive because yeah, I mean I, I think the jump from League One to the championship is not as big as championship to Premier League is it just about the money I don't know but I do think it's a bigger gap do you, do you agree with that uh, Absolutely. I think you can go up from League One to the Championship with a team of so-called League One players, whereas to get out of the Championship, you certainly need a couple of Premier League quality players. That's the problem that Brighton have found out in recent seasons. They just don't have that quality that they need in order to just kick it over the line. Whereas I think a lot of teams from League One can come with a lot of players that wouldn't necessarily get in other Championship teams. So it's a very good question that and keep them coming, Stefan, because we, we know you and we like you, but anyone can ask us a question. And uh, Stefan's friend, Daniel, will wrap up the show with this one. Um, he also sent us a question. So um, thank you, Daniel, for checking us out. We appreciate it. Um, I'm sure Stefan didn't pin you down and force you to listen to it at all. So <laughs> thank you for coming on board. Um, he says, just to follow up on Stefan's, Stefan's point, who, I ha- who I'm happy to confirm got me hooked on the podcast in the last few weeks. Thank you, sir. Uh, over the summer, Dean Smith um, said that he felt there was actually less tactical now required for the championship than League One. His point being that there was a lot more organisation and physical teams in the championship, while I think it's a bit harsh. There are quite a few teams, some who are doing well in the league, that looked look to get one up and then defend time waste for them as early as possible, which is hardly required when you're playing a team that's struggling for fluency this year as we have. What do you guys think? For me, player intelligence in the sense of being aware of what the teams are trying to do and a defence and the lack of defensive errors seems to have a fairly big influence, which does feed into Dean Smith's theory, not to mention the all important first goal. He says many thanks and look forward to the future podcast. Dan Chalkley. So um Another good point there. What do you make of that? Oh, that's a great question. Really great question. Um, I think there are a couple more. um, Yeah, there's definitely a different number of teams uh, in terms of philosophies down in League One compared to the Championship. But we have seen, uh, especially with managers like Tony Poulis, who have come through that lower league, that that style of football, of the uh, potentially negative tactics, working out very well and been quite successful whereas there are a bit a few more ball playing teams down in league one um although the pitches not every week can necessarily cater for that um i'm just having a look down the league now and pulling out people like uh mk dons bristol rovers oxford united all playing with um very good technical players um i think you'll find a few more um premier league loanees down at that level so more players with that kind of technical ability so it allows the managers to experiment a bit more. Whereas in the championship, you have got some quite utilitarian teams, should we call them? Uh, yeah, that will, I like that. Will, yeah. <laughs> I like that term a lot. Describe them. Utilitarian teams. Um, it's a great question, Dan. Really great question. And again, we do appreciate listening. And uh, if you've got other friends, tell your friends. Get them all on board. And uh, I'm sure Russell will agree with this. The, the more people we can get talking championship and everything, I think it's one of the. I think it's one of the sort of the USPs of this podcast, particularly this version of it. We get a lot of people saying, oh, we don't hear enough about the championship and, and leagues below. So, um, you know, if again, if you are a follower of a team in the League One or League Two or lower, give us a shout. Let us know who you are and um, we'll chat to you. We'll, we'll happily chat to you. So uh, please do let us know who you are 
and where you come from, as the old saying goes. Right, uh, we will wrap up the podcast there then. Um, we've got many, many things coming up over the, uh, the next period of time, as I say, the festive period of time. It seems a bit early to wish our listeners a, a very happy Christmas and safe tidings of uh, whatever you may well get up to. We, we wish you all the best. Um, seems weird to, to uh, say that a week in advance, but you might be listening to this on Christmas Day. So if you are, then a uh, very happy Christmas to you all. Um, Josh, thank you very much for making your debut. And uh, again, welcome aboard. Thank you. I hope everyone has a good festive period. Indeed. And uh, many thanks to Ross for um, sitting patiently while we record this um, with no voice or indeed uh, willpower to move from his bed, I'm sure. So uh, I hope he gets well soon. Right. So I have been your host, Chris. Uh, you can follow us, as I say, at the FH podcast on Twitter. We have we have uh, subscriptions. You can join us via SoundCloud, iTunes or YouTube. And remember, we're still trying to hit 500 subscribers on YouTube. So if you don't already subscribe, hit that button. We're currently at 337. So we've got a long way to go. But uh, if we get to 500, we might do a special podcast. Who knows? So that has been Football Hipsters English Breakfast. Uh, Keep enjoying your football. Plenty of it to come. My thanks to Josh and Ross. And we'll speak to you very soon. (laughs) 